my great pleasure to welcome to Time Space Visualizer Trevor Cooper and Ian Hallard. Hello both. Hi. Now, um, Robot of Sherwood, you were both um, members of the Band of Merry Men. What are your uh, memories of filming that? You go first, Ian. Go on. Okay. Well, I guess principally the weather. We, mm -hmm. we shot it in April um, in Cardiff and uh, the script called for kind of sun dappled glades and gorgeous idyllic weather. And when you saw the, the, the dates that they'd chosen to film and the location, you thought, <laughs> you're going to be lucky, aren't you? And then, and then we were, uh, practically unheard of. We had a fortnight's unbroken sunshine in, in, um, in Cardiff. So I guess the, the weather principally. Um, and then alongside that, the, obviously, because it was all location filming, um, feeling like you were in a big sort of Errol Flynn period movie with, with archery contests and... It wasn't actual jousting, but there may as well have been when we were at uh, when we were at the castle for the, those few days. Um, so yeah, that was uh, that's what I first think of when uh, when it uh, springs to mind. How about you, Trev? Um, I, to, to me, well, the interesting thing was was the contrast between because I'd done Revelation of the Daleks like you know twenty five years before, um, and then suddenly to be in in Robots, which was a full movie you know, with, with, it was shot like a movie and Paul, you know, it, it's essentially, I mean, a movie director in the way that he works. Whereas, you know, good old revelation of the da Daleks was very much the old TV studio with sort of, you know, Daleks made out of egg boxes. And, you know, it was all a little bit, you know, cardboard and, and you know, whereas whereas, whereas um, robots was was a massive great enterprise with you know filming in castles. And I remember we also I I remember on the first the first week we were there we were filming in this sort of it, somewhere outside Cardiff in woods, weren't we? And and there was this glade, there was this sort of forest glade that you got to by going down a very steep sort of, into a little steep hole. There was like a hole. And I just fell down it the first day I got there. I remember that was the first thing I did was I, I did the classic fryer tuck thing and slid in the mud all the way down to the bottom and felt like an idiot. You see, I just assumed that you were displaying your gift for physical comedy. You know? I thought it was... Probably <laughs> looking for the next gig, Trev. <laughs> well, exactly. Well, it was a real sort of stunt man for you know and I mean, I think people thought I was, the, you know, part of the stunt team. But yeah, I mean, another reason why it's a good job, the weather was good. Can you imagine that location had been pissing it down? Oh, a foot. It would have been like being in the trenches, wouldn't it? it would have all been in. I know. It was. It was. It was actually a very dangerous location, really. I mean, actually mm. getting down was really difficult to get to. Um, but it, well, once you got there, it was. It was really nice. It was worth it. Can you uh, remember how you got the parts that you played? Was it an audition or well, I just done, casting? I, I think I'd auditioned, I'd auditioned for Andy Pryor when we did An Adventure in Space and Time. And then obviously because when Mark had then written this episode, Andy actually said, oh, Ian sings, doesn't he? Do you think he'd be interested in doing this? Because obviously there was a bit of singing with Animal Day or Minstrel. Um, so, so that was it really, Andy had suggested it and, and who was I to, to say no? That's what happened. I had a slightly more roundabout route in that I was seen by Andy uh, and Paul for the part that Roger Ashton Griffiths played. Um, the, uh, the, the guy who was the ward of the, the girl who ended up being Marion, I think, is that right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And I was seen for that part, which was a smaller part. It was only like a scene or something. Um, and I was in the process of changing agents and it all got a bit confused. And I suddenly got um, a thing from my ex-agent, as it were, saying, oh, by the way, you got the Doctor Who. And that was like, oh, that's terrific. And, and they said, they're going to send you the dates. And they sent me these dates and they sent me like two weeks of dates. And I was thinking, this is a scene. Why, why, am I, why, am I, why am I on this for two weeks? And it wasn't until quite late in the day that I realized that I was doing a different part. And that basically what had happened was, I think it was Stephen Muffet, who I had worked with before on, on um, 
what was it called? Chalk, that sitcom that he wrote. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and uh, I saw him on the day and I said, what a surprise, you know, he said, well, he said, you know, I couldn't have you not be Friar Tuck, you know, so, you know, we swapped parts of Roger, who'd been up for Friar Tuck, got, um, played the, the, the one I was up for. So we swapped parts. He was a bit put out because he made less money off it. He was on it less. <laughs> but yeah, that, that's how it was, yeah. Now, obviously, you're part of the band of Merry Men. How did you get on with your fellow Merry Men? They were a terrible bunch of people. Um, <laughs> we had a lot of fun, actually. I just remembered, you know, we were... I can't remember the... We, stayed, we were all in the same hotel. So it was... So it was and we, you know, we stuck... There was Rusty and you, Ian, and me and Joe Kennedy. Mm -hmm. mainly i mean you know um and uh we had a we had a ball and and mark was around quite a lot visiting the set of, you know the writer allowed to be as the writer so he'd come and say it was so we we had quite a laugh just sort of sitting around and um it was it was they were nice but it was a very very nice bunch of people and we had matthew of course to entertain us matthew dale <laughs> um who played the other little john um and so, and and I was also struck by the fact, um, do you remember, did you come to the read-through, Ian? I can't remember. I don't know if I did. I don't know if I can make the read-through. I can't remember now. I have a thing. A, 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 a I have a It was at Rothlock, and it was, you know, it's that they had their read-through room. It's quite a big room, you know, and all the cast and crew. It was the, the most amount of people I've ever seen at a read-through. Because it was very early on when Peter... Capaldi had become Doctor Who, mm. and there was this. There were literally a hundred and so people in the room, and there was about you know twenty or thirty cast and crew, and then, and everyone had to introduce themselves. It took about an hour, <laughs> and it was it was it was all the people who were like worldwide, BBC worldwide. There were people from the Doctor Who who shop. There were people from the Doctor Who sort of exhibition in Cardiff, and the, all these people had suddenly been invited. And I and I remember what the lovely thing was: Peter Capaldi going, literally going around to everybody, particularly the new cast people, introducing himself and having a chat and being really welcoming. And mm. I thought that was lovely. I think it's such an industry, isn't it? That, that yeah, those those read throughs. There are the people from so many branches and financial interests and all that because of it, 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 it is and was big business. Yeah, yeah I, I, I do remember because it was really, a, it was only, I don't know, maybe third or fourth story that Peter had shot. And I, I really, I, um, I felt for him and I thought because, it's, as, as you know, Trevor, if, if ever you're doing, whether it's stage or TV or film or anything, so much of the atmosphere of the set is, is, is led by the attitude of, of your leading men and, and women. Absolutely. And they, really, they really kind of set the tone for how everything works. And I think, I think Peter, although he's had an amazing career, he, it's mainly been as a character actor. So he's probably, he, at that stage, he'd kind of done fewer, fewer, lead roles that would have um, expected him to do that. Um, so I did, I, I mean, I thought he did it brilliantly, but I did feel for him because it must have also been a slightly strange situation because he was simultaneously the uh, the lead, the head boy expected to do all that kind of welcoming stuff or, or it's very nice if people do do that in that position. But he was he was also the new, new boy as well. And even yeah, uh, even Jenna, obviously his, his, his co-lead had been around longer than him. And most of the crew at that stage had still be, had been with it since the very beginning, or or, 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 or at least for for many years. So I think so. I he did he did it really graciously and uh, and well. But I did kind of re remember feeling from him at the time that he's having to kind of slightly do a welcome to the set whilst whilst he he's, he's only just turned up himself, oh, not knowing what the set was. Yes, quite. Yeah. yeah. Um, you mentioned Jenna there as well. How was she to work with? She was lovely. Um, she um, and she, you know, she, as you say, she'd been she'd been doing it longer longer than Peter had. So um, she's gorgeous as well. I mean, that's part of the thing with Jenna. She's just very nice to look at, apart from anything else, apart from being a nice person. And it was a lot of fun. There was a lot of laughs. You know, there was a lot of corpsing going on, and 
and and you know and 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 Peter and Jenna had a very good sort of vibe going, you know. And there was a lot of stuff. There was a lot of stuff with the Merry Men, which took longer to film because we'd laugh and you know. <laughs> but uh, but no, she was great. And that was also all in the script as well, because the whole joke was the fact that we were supposed to be laughing incessantly. <laughs> That's that right. Danger that can start to pawn eventually when, when, yes. when the camera stopped running. You're going, oh God, thank goodness, I can simply be miserable for a minute. Um, <laughs> but it, I guess it was, I mean, it, it was, it, it's, it's always quite nice in that, that way where you, there's, there's not a huge amount of pressure on you because you're there as a, to kind of most of the, 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 the stuff was going on between um, Jenna, Peter, and Tom, of course, who was Robin Hood. Um, and then you get to go in and do your your little moment on your odd line or two. So and then you can sit back and have another cup of tea. So so it's quite nice. It's one of those situations where the pressure isn't on as much as it might be in some scenarios. Um, you've mentioned Tom there. Um, he was a sort of a proper Errol Flynn type Robin Hood. Did you did you sort of feel that that was that was the whole sort of experience that kind of classic Robin Hood story. Well, it was interesting. Did you get, did you have, get the original, I don't know which version of the script you first uh, had, Trevor, you may, you may not remember either. I know, I know Joe Kennedy certainly got the original kind of version of the story and the original idea, which, which I know they didn't mention at the time, but Mark has talked about, I think actually last time when we, when we did the, uh, the, the the phantom event a few weeks ago that actually the, the initial concept for the whole story was completely different um, oh. and the, the idea was that actually robin wasn't real uh, what wasn't the real robin hood um, and that what it would turn out to be is that the uh, where they'd ended up was actually set in the future and it was actually a, a kind of it was a holiday company who specialised in doing themed stag do events, <laughs> um, and they'd got ended, and and Robin and his merry men were the were the, the groom and 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 the guys on his stag do. They'd ended up going on this thing where you temporarily temporarily had a kind of kind of some kind of mind altering injection, um, and and there'd been a glitch, and they'd got stuck in the machine and believed that they were Robin Hood and his merry wow. men. Wow. So, and the whole idea was, so, so, so originally in the script, that was particularly why everything was supposed to be idealised. It was supposed to look like this kind of slightly unreal film set, and the, even down to the costumes, which, which were originally supposed to be these kind of pristine Errol Flynn, uh, Lincoln Green, as opposed to authentic Middle Ages uh, costume. Um, and that was the original, the, the, the original idea. Um, and I really liked that. I, and I remember Joe Kennedy saying, well, what happened to that? Why, why did it change that? And, it, and ultimately it was, it was Stephen who, who really wanted to go with the idea that knows he wanted to tell the story of Robin Hood as, as the hero in the real book. But I, I, miss my, I, thought, I thought it was a bit of a shame because I really liked that. That's a great, I, I'd not heard, I don't think I'd ever heard. I think that's new to me. I, I certainly yeah. didn't get a script that was like that. That's yeah. a fascinating. So it's like the idea. What's that? What's that Schwarzenegger film where you you can? Yes, uh, Total Recall. Total or, Recall. It's yeah. that it's like yeah. a sort of version of that in a way that you get. Yeah. Stuck. So what? So the story, rather than Robin, kind of therefore having to prove that he was a real hero to doc, to the Doctor. Actually, the, in that story, he starts off believing he's Robin Hood. Then his kind of world slightly falls apart when he realizes that he's just this ordinary guy. And then of course he comes through at the end by saving the day and proves that he is a hero. And right, okay. There. Which I thought it was, a, I thought it was a lovely, I did a lovely script. I, 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 as I say, that would have been the version I'd have preferred to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, quite. I was gonna say, because the, the version that, that we saw was quite light and comedic and, and fun. Would you have preferred a more, a more dark and serious um, episode? I think, I, I mean, now I've heard that one, I want to see that episode. <laughs> I'm not saying that's, 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 you know, that said, I mean, I think that a lot of the, a lot of uh, the, the, the sort of 21st century who has been, is quite dark. And it was quite nice, you know, to have that slight sort of relief in this episode that it was, it was sort of dappled sunlight and all that sort of thing. And it just looked brighter and, you know, mm -hmm. um, but I think that, that version still would have been fun. I mean, it, it, yeah. I, I made, it painted it and made it sound like it was this sort of dark dystopian um, vision, but uh, it would have still had a lot of comedy in it as well. But there uh, would have been a sort I of think, edge as well. No, I, 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 yeah. I never take your point. Yeah. 
I think Stephen felt it maybe sounded a bit too much like a war episode rather than a Doctor Who episode. I think that was right. his kind of his reservations. But but no, I, I think there's a I, I think there's there's room for for all kinds of storytelling, isn't there? And I, I, brief was very much too serious sort of a lot of banter comedy some a bit of physical comedy as well having the doctor trying to with a duel with a, with a spoon we'll be back to talk some more later on but for now thank you very much trevor cooper and ian hallard <laughs>